very good evening, and it's particularly good to be here. I wanted to be here so badly, precisely because we talk about sugar. Um, I don't have a background. Um, I, I was born in my home, by the way. We lived in the home of a well-known uh, afro guyanese family there. And I think our family uh, was assisted by that family to exit before uh, our own house blew up. Um, the one we were living in. Um, grew up in Leguan, incidentally, a uh, neighbor of Wakanam. And my father was a, a school principal there. We had a strong sense of, sense of community. Leguan was throbbing and a vital community until everybody started to migrate either to Canada, that was a preferred place, <laughs> or um, elsewhere, including Georgetown. And uh, uh, Leguan became what I now consider a timeless place, time for stopping. If you are looking for a place to relax, it's that sort of place. Um, attended high school in Georgetown, went to the University of Guyana, where I was taught a brand of economics that visited me with horror when I went to graduate school. It was a heavy dose of Marxism, Leninism. And basically that was all that we learned. Um, but, but graduate school woke me up in massive ways, including failure. And then I went on, did a master's, did a PhD, um, and, and if I might summarize myself now, uh, I have, uh, I, I, I'm going to answer a um, student from UG who on the way up asked me, do I, am I socialist? Uh, and I'm going to summarize myself and answer him at the same time by saying that I have a very healthy regard for markets and um, a fear of government, especially in this sort of environment. <laughs> Governments mess up wherever they go, and they're everywhere. But, but having said that, we have a special brand of government in the Caribbean and the third world, um, probably in developing world. And yet, as I think so, I, I remember a comment to uh, make by email to a good friend of mine, uh, his name is G-Man, you might know him, David. Um, we, we now have, or they now have, sitting right there in Washington, somebody we call a third world leader in his style. So, so, so I don't want to, to belabor the point that we are special in the Caribbean and Guyana when it comes to government. But I, I, I want to say I have a healthy regard for markets, meaning that I seek to understand the behavior of participants in markets. I am a behavioral economist. Um, and my son, if I could give you a sense of a healthy regard for markets. Um, today, my son, who's only 10, had a dental surgery and it was brutal. Well, markets are brutal. Markets present opportunities, but they are brutal. So, so here we go. There are markets that are brutal. There are governments to be to be aware of, to be wary of, and and then there there, there are ourselves. And I hope this evening that we could say a few things that um, give some sense of reassurance as we look to the future of sugar. I really want it to be here. I made an introduction, I was going to say, I'm also blunt. And so, I had to refrain myself, Mr. Ramirein, from asking if those um, comments of yours actually reflect the thinking of the boardroom of Daisuko, or if they're yours. Mind you, I'm not blunt, so I'm not asking that. <laughs> uh, I prepared some, some um, notes, and will ask you to bear with me as I stick to script, I want to talk first of all, as we think about sugar, I want to talk a little bit about um, oil. And to say that there is a claim, I've heard it several times, that the petroleum exports that we have, well, we will soon have, will make Guyana and Guyanese rich just at the time that the traditional sectors, such as sugar, are experiencing difficulties. I clearly don't agree with that particular way of looking at things. 
Petroleum is another commodity. And as we heard about sugar, its price fluctuates from $700 per ton, is it? Not per ton. Per ton. So whatever else it was, did you say $11 per ton? $200 per ton. Commodity prices fluctuate wildly, and so would petroleum prices. In point of fact, the petroleum prices have been moving recently, as recently as within the last two months, to create havoc in the markets and great distress among producers. So that's the first thing, and the first reason why I pause when I hear people say that petroleum is going to be our savior. Petroleum is just another commodity. Neighboring Trinidad and Venezuela are now experiencing economic challenges precisely because they have become dependent on oil or, or, and or gas, but prices collapsed and or there were production shortfalls precisely because prices were, were actually um, at fault here in the case of Trinidad. At any rate, it is never good to put all of one's eggs in the same basket. Economic diversification, which is the opposite of allowing one commodity to, to, to dominate the economy, is essential. The problem is that our oil wealth might stifle and not stimulate diversification. One might argue, and I am willing to do so, that the action that we've taken regarding sugar to send home 3,000 odd, maybe more, workers at one fell swoop might have been motivated precisely by our overexcitement at the prospect of oil revenues. But economic diversification will remain essential. Economic diversification, however, might not happen for a variety of reasons, even as we think oil and petroleum. The first is the so-called Dutch disease, which often happens in oil-rich economies. Foreign exchange earnings will increase, and increase rapidly. The local currency, Guyana dollar, will appreciate, and all our traditional exports will lose competitiveness we will begin to import almost every single thing. Not only because we might have American preferences, which we do, but because we will have the capacity to import every single thing. And whereas, Vice Chancellor, you were hoping that you'd soon be able to get your bow ties locally made, you might have to import them still. <laughs> but we will lose competitiveness, seriously, in all our traditional exports. Actually, if we, wanted to send, if we wanted to close down our factories, we actually just needed to do one thing, wait. And that would have happened. Because that is what um, um, the Dutch disease can do. What will happen too is that there will be a growth in what we call non-tradables. Non We've already had that happening. Dutch disease is not new to Guyana. Because we've been so dependent on, on um, foreign aid and external support, it's had the same effect. And so we've had a growth in non-tradables, things we can't export but we consume locally. Be they buildings and construction services feature significantly in our GDP. And that's why you have a lot of sand to transport and store. It's a non-tradable and we've been investing heavily in our non-tradables. Government services have been ballooning. That might have happened because we like government. But it also happens because it's one of those non-tradables that will grow anyway as we lose export competitiveness and so forth. So, so a big threat to diversification will come indeed from petroleum itself. What's more, taking a slightly different view, not a Dutch disease view, but a, 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 a product, um, I've forgotten the name of the view, but it says the same thing. It says that petroleum does not make use, it's another reason why we may not diversify. Petroleum does not make use of the capabilities and competencies of other traditional export sectors in the economy. In other words, production of new goods or services is facilitated when public and private competencies used in one product are also used in the production of a new output. 
the potential for what are called spillovers from one product to another at once reduces the risks and increases the rewards of innovation. Hausmann and Kunga, pioneers in this field of study, write that when there are these spillovers in competencies and capabilities, the new product benefits because they are, and I quote, the established industries have sorted out many of the potential failures involved in assuring the availability of these inputs. Seen in this perspective, structural change is slowed when such spillovers are not possible and petroleum is not going to have that sort of or enjoy those spillovers in competencies with our traditional sectors. People stand on its own. So that's another reason why uh, uh, diversification probably will be more injured by petroleum than anything else. I leave for our discussion what it is we should do with our petroleum because I want to get to sugar for a run of the time. So having said what I said about petroleum, that we shouldn't look to petroleum as that um, thing that will transform our society and uh, um, rescue us from the horror stories that might be confronting, um, let's say, Barbies. Um, having said that, I want to reflect briefly on sugar. And I might come back to you, Mr. Ramnerai. The first thing we can say about sugar in Guyana is that since its nationalization, it has been produced by a state-owned entity. We have heard the stories, the plans. We have heard them before. They didn't work. There is no guarantee that they will work. Particularly, and, and Mr. Halley, I might say, Dr. Halley, I might say this in your um, in response to something you said too, um, they might not work precisely because in both instances we did not think market. But like I said, that market is brutal. When we produce, if we're going to sell it, we have to produce for a particular market. There's a mistake that we make in Guyana. Market behavior is learned behavior. But I've seen too many people start up enterprises, start up production first, and then they begin to look for markets. It does not work that way. We find our markets first. We determine if indeed there are markets, then we begin to make the production decisions. So, so that's the first thing we could say about Gaisubo, is that it's a state-owned entity. The second thing that we could say about Gaisubo is that like any other organization, its future depends on its human resources. And actually, Mr. Ramana, the one thing that thrilled me and excited me in your presentation was that Eiffel will be a farmer's estate. So I want to close by suggesting that there is always we think solutions, we, there is always an institutional solution that we should think of first, an institutional solution that will be market-oriented. That institutional so solution is probably suggested by the farmer's estate. Imagine, and Mr. Armand, and you could imagine this well, because you know what's going on. But imagine a Gaisuko in which there was, in the field operations, all the agricultural operations, even the factory operations, there was no shirking. There were no strikes. There was no overgrown grass in any of our fields. Everything worked well. You know, that would have been the guy you would have wanted to keep. Well, it's a human resource problem. The problem of shirking is one that is well known in management. And it occurs when workers behave like workers. They're not on the same page as management is. So what you do is you get them on the same page. It's known as the agency problem. And I believe that the farmer's estates might be part of the solution. We ought to ask ourselves, this is the institutional um, um, question that we should be asking ourselves. Why is it that the private farmers appear to be doing this well? Is it because Gaisuko is subsidizing them? I think not. They are efficient. I'm not saying that is the answer. 
by saying it's to think about. And what I would have done, if I were on the board, I would have, I would have had the workers buy out, buy out the field operations. This is a naive solution. And I'd have given them shares in the factories as well if I wanted them to keep on producing sugar. And believe you me, they would have had to, they would have had to sell their sugar to the factories. They would get their workers to produce. They'll have to pay their workers wages. And all of a sudden, a lot of my problems will disappear. The only problem I'd have had is that they might have chosen to sell off the estates. But as I told you, I would, there was an institutional solution to that too. And we could have figured that out. One of them would have been giving shares in factories. Just want to tell you that for us to think about solutions, we must think institutional design, we must think, mar think markets, and we must think, I'm not going to elaborate on it, we must think, think energy. ExxonMobil is one of the leaders in advanced biofuels research using algae, which will grow in our fields, and using, uh, there's a brand of advanced biofuels known as cellulosic biofuels. I would like to end there. Thank you.